Our next speaker, Dr. Brian Craig Miller, will discuss Empty Sleeves, Confederate Amputees in Civil War History and Memory. This presentation, chock full of images, examines three persistent myths in our understanding of Confederate amputees, their surgeons, and their adjustments to post-war society. Dr. Miller is currently an editor for the South and the Civil War, offered through Kent State University, editor for Civil War History, and associate professor and associate chair of history at Emporia State University, author of many books, including his latest, Empty Sleeves, Amputation in the Civil War South, articles, papers, and monographs, he is the recipient of the 2014 Francis S. Somersell Center for the Study of South Research Fellowship, among several other honors. At this time, please welcome Dr. Brian Craig Miller. Well, thank you very much, Mike, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all so much for coming out today. It is great to be back in Gettysburg, even on, I think this may be my very first rainy day at Gettysburg. It always seems that my visits here are, are hot and 95 degrees. So thank you so much for, for coming to hear this not so joyous topic today. As the guns fell silent and the smoke cleared from the battlefield at Shiloh on April the 7th, 1862, Union Captain John W. Tuttle scoured the torn landscape in search of wounded comrades. Tuttle found several damaged Union and Confederate soldiers painfully dragging themselves through the deep black mud. The officer assisted the men to an area of the battlefield being used as a field hospital, where the most shocking and sickening sight of the day, or any other day during the war, met our view, he wrote. It was two or three wagon loads of amputated hands, arms, feet, and legs thrown in a heap. Tuttle had trained himself to react nonchalantly when encountering dead and mangled bodies on the field, but he failed to prepare himself for this naked and ghastly mass of human flesh, which haunted him for the rest of his life. The wartime images of amputation, mangled limbs, and bloody stumps remain vital to our understanding of the unprecedented level of suffering wrought by the American Civil War. The darker side of the conflict often piques curiosity, but it remains difficult for many Americans to grasp, because we like to think of our Civil War in terms of the noble officers and honorable soldiers engaged in grand charges across open terrain, not as hundreds of thousands of Americans falling dead in pristine pastures beneath towering oaks and along the banks of trickling streams and mighty rivers. The projectiles of war wounded hundreds and thousands more, creating a generation of men suffering from festering wounds and nagging injuries, and struggling following the removal of their hands, feet, fingers, toes, arms, and legs by a medical surgeon. The specter of empty sleeves and bloodthirsty surgeons haunts us still, in some cases, literally. On a recent haunted history tour of New Orleans, a guide stopped a group of tourists in front of the Hotel Provincial, located on Charter Street in the heart of the French Quarter. The picturesque hotel, boasting free Wi-Fi and a daily continental breakfast, previously served as the location of a Civil War hospital. Apparently, as guests dine on cheese Danish and attempt to get a good night's rest, the ghost of a Civil War surgeon, still wearing his blood-splattered apron, roams the hall. Pints of blood materialize in the bathroom sinks, and a few spectral patients still wander the hotel halls. In Savannah, Georgia, the specters of amputated soldiers wander the halls of a hotel turned, of a hotel turned hospital turned hotel. Now, amputation scenes are easier for us to come by in cinema, as Hollywood in fi war films tends to offer a shocking dismemberment scene. Our popular perception of Civil War hospitals and amputation emerged in 1939, embodied by the nursing services of Scarlett O'Hara in the epic film Gone with the Wind. O'Hara worked tirelessly as a volunteer at Peachtree Military Hospital in Atlanta. As the artillery shells of Union General William Tecumseh Sherman's guns rattle the hospital, Scarlett and Dr. Meade walk by a Confederate soldier with an injured leg. Despite a lack of chloroform, Meade quickly condemns the leg to amputation. As the distraught Confederate screams out in pain, Scarlett, ordered to assist in the operation, approaches the table with great curiosity and trepidation. 
The camera remains squarely on her face, revealing a look of horror and disgust as she witnesses an amputation without any anesthetic. Scarlett departs the hospital, emphatically telling an orderly who was relaying a message that the physician needs her, let him wait. I'm going home. I've done enough. I don't want any more men dying and screaming. I don't want any more. In the carriage ride back to her temporary home, the dashing Rep. Butler asks Scarlett if she has grown tired of seeing men chopped up. In the 1959 film The Horse Soldiers, after members of the Union Cavalry ride into New Union Station, Colonel John Marlowe, portrayed by John Wayne, and Major Kendall, William Holden, interact with a Confederate prisoner named Colonel Johnny Miles. As Colonel Marlowe argues about whether or not Confederate property can be considered contraband, Major Kendall interrupts the conversation, having recognized the Confederate prisoner from their time fighting Native Americans together before the war. Kendall also notices that his former comrade lost his right arm. Sorry about the arm, John. When did that happen? I want neither your solicitude nor to recall our association, responds the defiant Confederate, who then looks at Colonel Marlowe and asks, have I your permission to retire, sir? Marlowe casually orders some men to take the Confederate prisoner away to his holding cell. As Marlowe and Kendall watch Colonel Miles recede into the background, Kendall remarks, I can't figure a man like Miles giving up that easy. He's West Point, tough as nails. Maybe losing that arm took something out of him, responds Marlowe, but then Kendall quickly rejoins, the man I knew could lose both arms and still kick you to death. Even in our most recent Civil War film, Steven Spielberg's Lincoln, the horrific nature of Civil War medicine makes its an inevitable appearance. Lincoln is embarked on a carriage ride with his son Robert through the streets of Washington. As father and son debate Robert's desire to enlist in the war effort, the carriage parks in front of a military hospital. Robert refuses to follow his father inside as he knows that his father plans to use this hospital filled with Union amputees as a way to dissuade Robert from military service. But as Robert pa passes by that hospital door, a bloody wheelbarrow races by. Robert follows it to the top of the hill where black workers reveal its contents, severed hands, feet, arms, and legs. The workers then dump the fresh appendages into a pit filled with festering and decrepit limbs. The images disturb Robert and also send gasps through throat sold out crowds in theaters across the country. Now, however crude, Hollywood's attempts to recognize and depict suffering inflicted by war and amputation have often surpassed historians' own. In some ways, historians have absorbed the popular culture of amputation to write, particularly in their grand narratives of the Civil War. One historian, for instance, called the medical professionals one of the Civil War's most dismal failures for their apparent addiction to amputation. Another wondered if medical personnel simply just operated in ignorance and continued to make the same mistakes throughout the war, which led to too much unnecessary suffering and death. Others just saw medical personnel as carelessly throwing body parts everywhere, or another said that surgeons and doctors who were on hand were liable to make matters worse as they established a hospital that resembled nothing so much as a butcher's shop on market day. Thus, for my presentation today, I would like to examine some of the long-standing myths that have clouded our historical memory when it comes to amputation in the Civil War South. The scope of the phenomenon alone justifies attention, as thousands of soldiers returned home missing a limb and this created a permanent class of disabled and dependent men. Such veterans faced bouts of chronic pain, immobility, and the gawks and stares of citizens who viewed their missing appendage as a macabre spectacle. Disabled men were thrown back upon their spouses and families to assist them in dealing with the everyday physical and emotional rigors of life. But beneath our popular understanding of amputation lies a tale of overworked, but knowledgeable surgeons who worked their due diligence to ensure that the Civil War did not jettison into a medical quagmire. At the same time, soldiers actively made decisions about their medical care and struggled to find a sense of normalcy when they returned to the communities that had triumphantly marched them down dusty roads on their way to a war that acted like a battering ram upon the human body. So myth number one is going to be all Civil War surgeons are butchers. 
Civil War surgeons are the men who call for their next patient, swipe the saw or scalpel across the blood-stained apron, hacked and sawed away at the appendage of human flesh, then toss the limb and call for their next victim. The negative reputation of a Civil War surgeon eager to cut without sufficient sympathy or knowledge emanated from the very ghastliness of the act of amputation itself. We cannot deny the horrific nature of removing a limb. For thousands of sur soldiers, a battlefield in injury prompted their very first visit to a doctor, a surgeon, or even a hospital. Almost none have witnessed an amputation before or surgeons performing any sort of operation like this. Thus, the nature of the wounds had created such a horrific scene. Lead and shrapnel bones crushed and shredded, damaged flesh, vessels and vital organs producing a natural reaction to pain, cries, moans, screams, and groans. Without any prior exposure to such an environment, damaged soldiers quite naturally panicked and concluded that anyone who could do such things must be a monster. The process of amputation, we must remember, produced a high level of trauma, not just for the patients, but for those who observed it as well. The recollections of sights and sounds associated with amputation often appear most vivid among those who were merely witnesses. The sheer potential of horror at the hospital experience prompted hundreds of soldiers and civilians to view these field hospitals as ghoulish ground. Soldiers recalled the piles of bloody looking limbs and never forgot that picture. Charles Houston at the Battle of First Manassas recalled hearing the groans from men undergoing the agonies of amputation. The cries alone, he noted, could crack the stillness of night until the very corpses trembled. In addition to these sights and sounds, soldiers and civilians also had to smell the aftermath of numerous operations. Field hospitals, particularly those with the piles of corpses and rotting limbs, created a stench that engulfed nearby homes and communities. In Little Rock, Arkansas, one citizen noted the nauseating aura overhanging the city, especially as temperatures warmed and just about everybody had the smell of putrefaction in their nostrils. Men, women, and children across the city suffered the shock of unsightly mangled bodies. One civilian remembered amputated arms, legs, as well as bodies of the dead were buried as expediently as possible, but the odor of festering sores and of death could be detected whenever anyone went near any of the improvised hospitals. Time and again, as soldiers, civilians, and nurses described amputation, the word butcher cropped up in letters and diaries as a descriptor of surgeons. The label, according to one historian, originates in the soldier's frame of reference, butchering back home. Most soldiers were farmers and had ample experience breaking down pigs, deer, cows, chicken, and other form of livestock and game. Even Abraham Lincoln was comfortable enough with butchering to use it as a metaphor for Grant's Grand Five Army campaign in 1864. Those not skinning can hold a leg. Thus, when soldiers saw the surgeon operating, they connected his performance to their own experiences dismembering an animal back home. Civilians and soldiers conveying their impressions of the first surgery they had probably ever seen would naturally adopt this metaphor. And it's not necessarily as insulting as it might seem. Butchering in that day and age especially was understood as a skill requiring a great deal of precision. Even so, in referring to surgeons as butchers, Confederate soldiers butted up against the, but, the budding professionalism, not to mention the masculine honor of medical men who were not keen on highlighting such comparisons. A butcher takes lives, a doctor preserves them. Although the image of the surgeon as butcher has appeared in numerous primary accounts that have dominated our historical and popular understanding of Civil War medicine, the record paints a completely different portrait. Patients commonly portrayed field doctors as devoted men who exhibited patience, kindness, and unrelenting skill in the face of trying situations. One man praised his Confederate surgeon as full of the milk of human kindness. Another rebel private praised his surgeon that, who had so much sympathy as familiarity with suffering is likely to leave. Patients made a point to comment on how their surgeon acted as a gentleman 
and affirmed that the physician displayed the prime characteristics of manhood, a reputable demeanor, a clear and judicious mind when making medical decisions, and a caring countenance when performing difficult operations. Such praise, though anecdotal, is evidence that not all army physicians became inured to the rigors of battlefield surgery and hospital care. The greatest compliment paid to doctors, moreover, sometimes came after the war when they encountered their former patients. E.A. Craighill, a Confederate surgeon, wandered the streets of Lynchburg, Virginia after the war. He recalled having no food and no money with only disappointment and black despair in his heart. But one day a group of men approached him in a cordial manner and expressed great joy in seeing him. The former patients, members of the 34th Massachusetts, simply wanted to thank their surgeon, whom they recognized for his kindness and attention. They also shared the good news of a fellow comrade who had lost his legs at the hand of a Confederate surgeon who now claimed to have the best stump in all of New England. To be sure, errors were made, and some were quite costly, as some patients were left with festering stumps or shards of bone that poked through a freshly sutured wound. Yet as the war progressed, surgeons learned and adapted as they were assisted by the extensive bounty of medical literature, additional personnel who helped make rationale medical decisions, and the experience of learning and now knowing when or when not to cut. Thus, by 1864, according to medical records, the um number of amputations performed by Confederate surgeons nosedived to only a few percent of the total number of gunshot wounds treated during the massive military campaigns in Virginia and Georgia. The second persistent myth is every single patient who ended up in a hospital tent underwent amputation. Dangerous accidents, piercing bayonets, and unforgiving projectiles sent thousands of Confederate soldiers and officers to the hospital tent. Upon their arrival, the patients certainly had a lot to take in, sights, sounds, smells. But as they waited, their thoughts usually drifted amongst their own mind to their survival, their family, their fellow comrades in arms. They assessed their own masculine self-worth as they posited their past and potential future. The waiting particularly plagued them as they were forced to think about the possibility of amputation for hours or even days. In extreme instances, the anxiety of waiting combined with the threat of losing a limb resulted in some violent confrontations. Right here at Gettysburg, Dr. Henry Minor dealt with a Captain McMay who tried not once but twice to shoot the doctor who determined that he would need to lose a finger. As the operation commenced, McMay suddenly plunged his hand under his coat and pulled out a pistol, then the muzzle again, thrusted the muzzle against the surgeon's back and pulled the trigger. Fortunately, a fast-acting fellow surgeon intervened and saved the doctor's life. McMay tried to shoot the surgeon again when the candle that illuminated their hospital tent blew out. Minor wrote, there we were in the dark with the angry man trying to shoot again, the doctor struggling to hold him and to hold the pistol. Captain McMay, well aware of the dangers of amputation and the risk that he might never return to battle, resulted in violence to save his finger. After all, the hospital recovery bed sapped a man's ability to prove his worth in battle before his peers. Thus, the size of the amputation ultimately did not matter. Another Confederate officer threatened violence if doctors followed through on the amputation of his da damaged leg. A musket, musket ball at the Battle of Shiloh broke both bones in the left leg of William Brimage Bate, a colonel with the Second Tennessee. While the surgeons insisted on amputation, Bate spurned the advice and ordered his servant to give him his pistols so he could let the surgeon know he intended to protect that leg. Bate refused to surrender mastery of his own body to a surgeon and kept those pistols at his bedside for the remainder of his hospital stay. Bate survived, kept the bad leg, and returned to the war, though with quite a bit of difficulty. A veteran remembered in various incidents of horses being killed at Chickamauga, he had to be lifted each time upon another horse, unable to mount one alone. After he received a bullet wound to the foot at the Battle of Chickamauga, Private William Fletcher also resorted to violence at a battlefield hospital. 
Fletcher witnessed a wide array of injuries among his comrades, including one soldier named Frank, who had been permanently disfigured after being shot in the face. Fletcher chided the unfortunate soul, remarking that he would make better success courting when he got back with his back to the ladies. The soldier shot back, that will be better than you, as you can't turn anyway to hide your wooden leg. Both men then watched as the surgeon cut off the foot of another unfortunate soldier and tossed it into a scrap heap. Evidently, what had been intended as a humorous exchange had gotten under Fletcher's skin, and as the surgeon approached to investigate his wound, Fletcher kicked the surgeon in the soldier's shoulder, prompting the doctor to state, I will leave you alone then, without treatment. Fletcher replied, Doc, that is what I want, and the fellow that I considered most to blame would make the mistake of his life if he treated without any sanction, as that man has been treated, put under influence of something, and when he comes to, his foot is gone. Fletcher ended up escaping the field hospital with his wounded leg still attached, but there were constant medical consequences. He traveled by rail to Augusta, Georgia, and recuperated at a local church where the Sisters of Charity assisted him in his recovery. He unsuccessfully tried to obtain a set of crutches on numerous occasions, only to find his name at the bottom of the waiting list each time. When the crutches finally arrived, Fletcher was unable to use them because gangrene had set into his wounded foot. He received an acid treatment burning for seven straight days. If I had been a drunkard, he wrote, I would probably have thought I, at least, was threatened with delirium, he noted, as the worm or snaky feeling would start at the mouth of the wound and then make a hurried zigzag run up through my knee, although his foot turned downward, which forced him now to walk on his toes. The doctor suggested either breaking the foot or amputation, since they estimated only a 10% chance of saving the foot. But Fletcher replied, I said I would prefer life with a crooked leg and walking on my toes to an artificial foot. So they said they would consider it no more. When Fletcher made the final decision to resist amputation, the words from that initial hospital visit with a fellow injured soldier rang clearly through his mind. With Fletcher not knowing if women would embrace or resist Confederate amputees in the post-war era, he chose to remain a physically complete man, despite the horrific pain and the deformity, and lived through the post-war era without having to fear romantic rejection based on an amputation. Confederate amputees also often felt a tinge of regret or a burst of panic in the hospital bed as they wondered if women would accept their new physical deformities. Kate Cumming, when nursing amputated patients, commented, I constantly hear the unmarried ones wondering if the girls will marry them now. Despite such overwhelming concerns, the men seemed in solid spirits. As Cumming recalled, we have a room with seven men in it who have lost a limb each. It is a perfect treat to go into it as the men seem to do little else but laugh. The men routinely told Cumming to call on the women to come see these amputated men since they would make excellent husbands because they would never ever run away. She hoped that the women of the South would re re reset their attitudes towards the disabled man and work to end suffering of many men who had only performed their duty. The amputated men who sought the advice from nurses about how women back home would perceive their, would, would perceive their injuries would, hear, would get asked questions like, when do you think my wound would be well enough for me to go home? One soldier requested a speedy return home because he worried that his woman back home might reject him or simply forget about him and move on. But the nurse confidently predicted, ah, but you must show her your scars. And if she is a girl worth having, she will love you all the better for having bled for your country. And you must tell her that it is always the heart that is bravest in war and that is fondest and truest in love. The soldier seemed content with this explanation and went back to regaining his full strength to return home. Walter Lenore, a Confederate soldier who lost his right leg at 2nd Manassas in August of 1862, also worried about how amputation would now alter his life and his romantic prospects. He noted in his diary that his head now fills with thoughts of what he would have to give up because he was an amputee. 
First, I thought of my favorite sport of trout fishing, which I would now have to give up. Then I thought of skating, swimming, partridge hunting, my other favorite sports, which it occurred to me that I would never enjoy again, he noted. Yet sports wasn't at the top of his list of priorities, because he confessed that before all these things, I thought sadly of women. For I was not old enough to have given up the thought of women. It may not seem very credible to me that I thought first of the mere enjoyments which I was to lose with my leg, but such were my poor, unworthy thoughts. The loss of his leg transported Walter Lenore from a world of independence to one where he now had to reassess his own dependency and accept assistance from others in order to survive. During his recovery, he remained particularly dependent on a Mrs. Samuel A. Chancellor, who spoke to him in that sweet, kind woman's voice that thrills the heart of the sufferer as nothing else can, inquiring after each of my situations and wants. Once he returned home, his greatest fears materialized. Lenore did not marry and lacked any true romantic prospects. In order to survive financially, he spent his first post-war months dependent on some slaves who assisted in farming. He wrote to his sister, you know that I had made up my mind before the war that I would not again be a slave owner, but circumstances now have made me a slave owner. Prior to his military service, Lenore wrestled with the morality of slavery and declared that he would live an independent life without any connection to the institution. Amputation, though, shifted Lenore's internal perceptions about slavery and forced him to now remain dependent on his slaves for his health and welfare. While a dependency on slaves compromised Lenore's principles, he felt that he had no choice. His survival necess necessitated an enhanced dependency on slavery until emancipation forced Lenore to look elsewhere in order to deal with his newfound difficulties of disability. This concern for our post-war livelihood also framed wounded Confederate decisions regarding amputation. The removal of a limb could prevent a man from continuing his pre-war occupation. Colonel M.D.L. Stevens, who was a member of the 31st Mississippi Infantry, received a wound in his upper leg at the Battle of Franklin. After an assemblage of doctors deemed an amputation necessary, Stevens called on Dr. Wall, the chief surgeon at the makeshift hospital. Stevens beseeched, I am a physician and have a wife and two children at home. Everything is swept away in my country and the Negroes are free. I will be compelled to practice my profession if I get back there. You know that I cannot practice medicine in the hill country if I am quartered up. Stevens, who decided to serve in the rank and file rather than the medical corps, emphatically declared, I will go with my leg and my leg will go with me. Now, Dr. Wall offered his own assessment, stating, I think it is best for you to let your leg go. As tears swelled within his eyes, Stevens begged Wall to prevent the amputation, and the surgeons finally relented. The decision prompted a sharp rebuke from another physician who vociferously disagreed with Wall, and the two nearly fought over the proper course. But Wall, a complete stranger, was willing to shoot a surgeon threatening amputation. He well understood Stevens' plight. While an amputation would remove a limb, it would also diminish Stevens' stature as a man, a professional, and compromise his ability to support his family. As a man and a doctor, Wall certainly understood this. Without slavery to buttress his household income, Stevens would depend on a profitable medical profession in order for his family to survive. He worried about the practicalities of missing a leg that could not be construed as a reputable thing that would have guaranteed a bounty of potential clients. A potential patient would not find credence in the diagnosis and treatment of a physician who looked like a patient. Stevens needed both legs to maintain his honor, protect his reputation, and provide for his family. Wall, in turn, acted honorably as well through the maintenance of a promise to save the leg of a patient a pledge he was willing to support, even with violent means. Our third myth is that Confederate amputees experienced a joyful homecoming, and this is partially based on our lost cause mythology that sees the South embracing their wounded comrades. Bill Hicks never got over the amputation of his leg during the Civil War. Described as a fine young man, an Apollo in form, and the model of strong physical manhood, Hicks returned home to work as an attorney.
Even though his legal profession seemed promising, the absence of a leg preyed on his mind, prompting him to make a rather rash decision. Rather than live the rest of his life as a cripple, a doctor noted, in a fit of despondency, he blew out his brains. He was not alone. Charles Minninger Road received a gunshot wound in his leg at Appomattox in 1865. Although the doctors allowed him to keep his leg, he limped for the remaining days of his life. With his business endeavors failing and a mountain of debt consuming his ever-growing family, Minninger took his life in 1888. In another case, a Confederate cavalry in, living in Nashville after the war decided that he could no longer live as an amputated man. He sacrificed his leg at Fort Pillow in 1862 and took his own life via a dose of chloroform in 1872. John Campson, who was a Confederate artilleryman, shot himself in the head while standing in front of the looking glass. Campson, who had lost an arm during the Civil War, ended his life after it had been proven that he had severely beat a child. Taking one's own life or the very thought of suicide constituted one response albeit an extreme one, to living as a, as a disabled man. The very notion that veterans are contemplating suicide and taking their own lives reveals the depths of the challenges they faced in their attempts to reintegrate into civilian life. The potential negative reaction towards amputated men ebbed and flowed in the post-war period. On April 19, 1865, two children, ages 9 and 11, encountered a drunken man on the streets of Macon, Georgia. In an act of depravity, according to the newspapers, unparalleled in the annals of civilization, the children grabbed a rusty saw, cut off the man's leg, and left the leg behind. However, the patient would recover because the children had severed off his wooden leg. While the newspaper reporter remarked about these events in horror, the children involved had operated from a different form, point of reference. Rather than seeing the man as a veteran, the children had punished a drunk for violating societal perceptions of manhood. The outrage from the newspaper reporter reflected anger over the patient's failure, and maybe even Southern society's failure, to sensitize children to the role of the disabled veteran in the New South. Due to their disabilities, many veterans struggled to find financial endurance, and such economic struggles were represented in various cultural venues. The Carpetbagger in New Orleans, which was a play published in 1877, told the story of Peter Plucky, a Confederate veteran who lost both arms and lived with a lame leg. He bemoaned that his children had to pick up rags for a living and found their breakfast each day in the gutter. Plucky called himself a poor piece of man and wished he had been shot in the head instead. As the Confederate veteran is alone on stage contemplating suicide, suddenly from stage right, a Union amputee approaches him. In an act of reconciliation, the Union man thanked the tattered Confederate for saving his life at a battlefield near Richmond. Both men shared a distinct commonality, a missing limb that brought them together again in a moment when past scores receded into history. Captain Tommy Trugrit, that's the name of our Union officer, told the distraught Confederate, don't look at life through such blue glasses. The sun shines, yet you can eat, drink, and sleep as well as if you had a dozen arms. The two decide to go into the grocery store business together. After all, True Grit had been receiving a lucrative government pension and wanted to bury the sectional hatchet in this grand moment of reconciliation. Your sons, True, De True Grit declared, shall have two pieces of men for their daddy, and two pieces make one pretty good whole. The play goes off on a weird tangent in act number two, where it turns out that the Confederate's daughter, Polly, ends up being pursued by Union officer Tommy True Grit, but Polly really isn't interested. When True Grip wondered if it was his empty sleeve that ruined his chances with the daughter, Polly, she reminded him that the empty sleeve was not his worst defect, but rather his Yankee identity. True Grit, though, wishes for an ocean to love that would wash over the bitterness of the Civil War. And as in any love story, in the very end, Polly changes her mind, marries the Yankee who saves her destitute family, and they all live happily ever after. But the cultural cues that we can take from this particular play start to manifest themselves in, re 
in reality. John Reed, who lost a leg during the early years of the war, returned home and worked in a tobacco house in a greatly reduced condition, laboring at a slow but persistent pace. A Confederate soldier in Georgia, missing both arms, spent his post-war years hitched to a plow that his wife guided, supplying all of the muscle but none of the direction. Others never recovered from their war service, ended up in the almshouses, the insane asylums, the drunk tanks, the prisons, and the graveyards. One member of the 5th Louisiana found all opportunities for employment closed to him, and he noted, truly it seems to me that the time has come where signs need to appear that say no main Confederate need apply. With few employment opportunities, forestalled educations, or disabilities that prevented manual labor, some Confederate amputees started to beg. An unnamed Confederate veteran who lost his leg in Atlanta in 1864 was a fixture at the steps of the Capitol building in Austin, Texas. And we actually have a drawing of him right here. A physician who saw him reflected that begging had emerged as a routine practice across the South as ex-Confederates stumped their weary way through life on crutches or wooden leg. Of course, the decrepit, grizzled, and gray veteran on the Capitol steps could not afford an artificial limb, which partly explains why he ended up selling pencils on the Capitol steps. Depending on a manufacturer, artificial legs could cost anywhere from $70 to over $100, at a time when the average laborer in America earned about a dollar a day. When the doctor approached the veteran, he felt a tinge of guilt and wrote, Poor old confed, despised old rebel, they told you a wound would be an honor, and you a hero. Cruel mockery, bitter deception. Your life blood shed, your youth wasted, all in vain. But even begging had its barriers. In 1879, the city of New Orleans cracked down on street beggars, especially those who were wounded, injured, or diseased. Men were forbidden from wandering abroad and endeavoring by the exposure of wounds or deformities to obtain or gather alms. One newspaper decried the whole community is shocked and disgusted and sickened that these main beggars may secure a few nickels. In 1883, the city organized an event known as the Corralling of the Cripples, wherein city officials picked up all the disabled beggars, including Confederate veterans, and placed them in the Shakespeare's Alms House. Realizing that Confederate veterans were facing this punishment, many southern cities amended that begging law to say you could remain a beggar on the streets if you were a Confederate veteran. How do you prove that? You were wearing your Confederate uniform. And thus, we have cases of men who were injured in industrial accidents or other forms of disasters, stealing or buying Confederate uniforms so they could move through this loophole that had been written into the law. And the previous speaker, if you saw, Brian Matthew Jordan, has excellent versions of this going on in the Union as well. So both sides of the, of the spectrum are seeing these sorts of shenanigans going on to obtain the identity of veterans to get their pensions in the North or here in the South to get an opportunity to beg for money. Confederate amputees forced to beg for money exhibit a heightened level of dependence, not merely on family and community, but also on strangers. The preferred arrangements for this kind of assistance were the benevolent organizations that sprung up across the South during and after the Civil War. Asking for such help, though, came at a price. Some men decried, admitting that they had failed to support themselves and had no one else to fall back on. One former Confederate noted the thought of having to go to the pauper's home is a horror and a dread to many of us. To beg, we are ashamed. To accept the charity of friends, to spend their waning days on earth reliant on charitable organizations or groups was simply seen as humiliating. Yet men had few options, especially when they faced dire economic opportunities and lackadaisical state legislatures that did not quickly reach consensus on how to support their veterans. The American Civil War produced an entire generation of wounded, disfigured, and disillusioned men who returned to a world that they no longer recognize. Many survived to leave meaningful lives, even as they coped with the new realities of destruction and defeat. But their sheer number and peculiar circumstances made them impossible for the culture to ignore. Much has been written about the American culture and how it adjusted to the sheer amount of death meted out by the American Civil War. 
But less has been written about those who did not quite die, who died in part, or returned to bear living witness through their ravaged bodies to the steep cost of war. Understanding the impact of the empty sleeve on all societies who find themselves ravaged by war allows us to follow in the words of Lincoln, who called on us to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Thank you very much. And I believe we have some time for questions. Uh, Brian, uh, how, how, uh, how accurate is the assertion that uh, for many of the wounds that uh, soldiers suffered in the Civil War, even if, it were, even if they were suffered today, uh, amputation would still be the preferred uh, uh, treatment? The, what happens as the war progresses, what we see particularly in 1861, especially after Bull Run and Shiloh itself, is that when you have thousands of men who were treated, who had gunshot injuries, who are coming into makeshift field hospitals, the surgeons are completely overwhelmed. They don't have the staff. They don't have the time. They certainly weren't expecting thousands of bodies to be treated, so they quickly, quickly cut off the limbs as much as possible. In fact, the numbers of amputations are pretty staggering when you look at Bull Run and Shiloh itself. Some estimates are nearly 5,000 amputees produced out of the Battle of Shiloh itself. But once we see the war continuing to progress and this reality of a medical quagmire that could actually develop, the surgeons themselves actually go to the medical literature or begin revising the medical literature that was very explicit of when or when not to cut. And they had very graphic, detailed images that you can see from some of these surgical manuals that were published in 1861, then revised in 63, 64. And you have the Confederate Medical Journal, in particular in the South, that details again when and, and, when, and when not to cut. So surgeons begin assessing the injury itself, and that is why we see the large number of amputations rapidly decline throughout the war. It wasn't always the most preferred version of medical treatment, but by the end of the war, I would say it became the most practical one under the right set of circumstances, which is why we see so many gunshot wounds that are left to naturally heal or go through other processes to heal by the end of the war rather than quickly cut off the limb itself. It's, it's one of these staggering things that when you actually get into the medical records themselves, which are lousy in 1861, the Confederacy did not have this bureaucracy established where they could count the large number of amputees as they went through their daily hospital lives and records. You had sort of scattered medical books that would note how many operations took place. But by the end of the war, all of that is standardized. There are particular sheets. And going through the medical records, you can actually count how many guns shot wounds were treated, how many of those resulted in amputation. And those percentages, particularly during the big campaigns in 1864, are much lower than I think historians have previously been able to ascertain. And that is based on the medical records that we have, unfortunately, because the Confederate government destroyed a lot of them as they evacuated Richmond in 1865. So it's not always, I would say, necessarily the preferred version of medical treatment, but it becomes a practical version, particularly with more skill and knowledge by the end of the war, that ensured that many of these men would actually survive that amputation. Great, thank you very much.